Hello everyone and you're all very welcome to today's webinar where we'll be launching Master Series 2022 Major Version Increment. It's great to have so many of you with us here today and uh, just introduce myself. My name is Martin O'Gara, I'm a lead developer and director with Civil and Structural Computer Services and I've been uh, quite intimately involved with all the various um, developments that have taken place over the past 12 to uh, 10 months um, that we're going to be taking a whistle stop tour of here today. Uh, so uh, we'll hopefully get a flavour of what you have to look forward to. As per usual in our GoTo webinar session, you have your questions box on the GoTo panel. Feel free to type those questions as we go. Uh, several of my colleagues here are with us, uh, with me to answer those during the session, uh, but I'll also be taking any uh, unanswered or highlighted questions at the end, and we'll do a, a review of those also. Um, those will be answered and emailed to you in a follow-up email also. This webinar has been recorded and it will be uh, posted to our normal channels uh, on completion of the webinar, and you'll also get an email with a link to that also. So we're here today to see what you have to look forward to in Master Series 2022. This is our major version increment uh, that we have. And this uh, development cycle, our focus primarily has been on really mining our user requested features lists. Uh, everything that comes our way from our customers, um, you're the people that are using the software. We listen very closely to your experiences and uh, your suggestions and your feedback. Those are all logged in our um, development systems here and uh, are uh, ranked and weighed and um, looked at in, in terms of their uh, value to the system. So we've really been mining those this time around and we've uh, from those lists, uh, we have focused on the, the, the items that we believe deliver maximum productivity, giving uh, you, um, you know, a lot of value. Uh, so we've focused on the ones that uh, are um, going to really improve uh, your usage of master series. And we continue on that um, uh, as, as uh, the next development cycle continues. So over 125 improvements have been made. And um, just to give you a little bit of a flavor of where they're focused and concentrated, what we have here is our word cloud, which is weighted based on the number of improvements in each of these areas. Uh, a little bit of a, um, a could potentially misrepresent in a way because uh, some features might take several hours to complete, uh, wh whereas other features might take uh, maybe 200 man hours to complete. So, uh, but it does give us a flavor and I think it's an accurate enough representation of where the development effort and uh, where the, the, the majority of um, the, the new features are uh, coming on board. So you can see there obviously are flagship programs like the, the master frame analysis engines, the, uh, the master key connections uh, and the composite beam in particular there, uh, quite a bit of work being done this time around. But lots of areas have <coughs> seen, uh, uh, you know, to a lesser extent, uh, improvements as well. So we've tried to do a sweep across the board and, and pick up those high value items uh, to implement into the software for you for this version. Where, uh, when you install Master Series, uh, head on over to the resources from the front screen, and from there you'll find the What's New, and the What's New document will indeed give you a full list of everything that's included. And uh, do take your time to review that document. Um, if you've got the time, have a look inside Master Series to see if you can uh, locate these new features and, uh, and, and start using them because we really do think they will uh, save you time and increase your productivity in using the software. What we're going to do here today, actually, um, because the, the, the number of features that we have and the, the, the way in which they're uh, spread across the system is, is quite scattered, uh, rather than using the software and jumping around in and out, opening lots of different files, trying to find different features, we're going to be doing <clears throat> our presentation today, primarily in PowerPoint with uh, little video snippets pre-recorded, uh, which is a little bit of a break from the norm for what we usually do, but the, the content is so varied. I think we hopefully, uh, I think your, your head might spin a bit if we were to, to try and do it uh, any other way. So uh, you'll definitely get a good flavor of, of 
what we're going to look at. You'd be pleased also to know that we're definitely not going to go through each 125 improvements. Uh, this would be a very long webinar. So we have selected what we feel are the ones that we like, our favorites. Um, but our favorites might not be your favorites. So that's why I encourage you to look at the What's New list because you might find lots of things that we're not going to potentially mention today or focus on uh, that are more valuable to you than what we have come across. So it really is just a flavor for some of the things that you're going to look forward to. So starting off, uh, master frame are uh, the core of our uh, modeling um, environment. Um, you might uh, know this as the, the building design suite core, uh, but master frame really forms the, 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 the main module of the, the building design suite. Uh, when we talk about master frame, we are talking about master frame pro and uh, all of the other uh, related issue or programs to that as well. Um, so 30 improvements here, and this is our top five. Uh, first of all, steel sections open library database file settings stored within the master frame file. Now, what's the issue here? I'll just let this video play a little bit into it. Uh, so when we go to in the master frame file into properties, into settings, we can see here we've got some database settings that can be stored with the file. Now, these database settings um, effectively record what database the file has used. Uh, just to give you a little bit of context, Master Series has a, a, a as an application has a global level steel sections open library database. So all of the various uh, parts of Master Series that potentially use that steel sections library will use the current global uh, steel sections open library database. So if you're using open library database one as your current database, everything that you would have used in Master Series every file that you would have opened would have been referencing that database. Um, for most people, that isn't an issue. Um, you maybe just always use the default database and you don't have a need to use a different one. Perhaps where you do have a need to use a different one, you would have had your own customized one and you would have used that and that alone. But where you potentially had different files that were created at different times with different databases, then when you go back to reopen that file, uh, you would have had to remember, well, this was created with a different database and it had different sections in it, and then you would have had to change to that database before opening the file. This solves that problem. This saves the database setting with the file, which is indeed the default for moving forward for new files. So the file knows which database it used, and also when opening the file, it'll switch to that database automatically without you having to switch to it. Also, any particular settings in the database, like the checkboxes that you see here, for hiding old sections and uh, things like that. Those are all saved, uh, can be optionally saved now with the file. Uh, the last checkbox that you see there is quite interesting and that's embed steel sections database, uh, and, and embed uh, steel sections and user sections database in the data file. Now these steel section open library databases are independent from the file itself. They're a separate database. And uh, if you potentially were using your own steel sections that wasn't an out-of-the-box steel sections database and you ship this file to uh, somebody else that isn't part of your organization, then you would have also had to provide them with the associated database file and they would have had to um, copy that into your default directory, which is indeed Program Data Master Series. And, uh, uh, but to avoid you having to do that, you can embed those databases directly into the file, which makes sharing of the file that bit easier. Next up, we have a, a new snap setting, which is really useful in lots of different areas. Um, probably the uh, the motivation to include this setting was when people were using um, CAD layers. CAD layers was introduced a few years ago, which is the ability to import a CAD file and create that as a layer uh, for to provide you with snapping artifacts and objects to assist you in drawing new structure, loads, grid lines, things like that. Um, what we were finding was people were maybe importing CAD files that had maybe wall layouts for, this is a domestic wall uh, arrangement for um, a house plan. I'll just let this play a little bit. And uh, as we can see, what we'd like to do is put a beam in the middle of this wall, but the snaps don't really facilitate that or rather didn't facilitate that. So we've got a new snap setting for um, offset to 
perpendicular to line. So the walls are 0.3 meters thick here. So we're entering in half of that to give us a mid snap on that. And as we move around here, we can see as we move outside, we get intersection snap between the uh, adjacent lines and moving inside. Now we've got a snap where we want it and scrolling down to the other end of where we want to include this structure, we get our intersection snap coming through there as well. So useful for CAD lines. Um, I'm always in favor of actually when, when you're bringing in a CAD layer to actually provide uh, a layer in it that uh, has the artifact that you can directly snap to as well. I think that's potentially easier. Uh, but the offset snapping uh, could be very useful, not just for CAD la layers, but uh, for, for other applications as well. For instance, it doesn't have to be a CAD layer. I've uh, turned on a, a 0.5 meter uh, offset snap here, and we can see it offsetting from these members. So that's uh, really quite useful uh, there. In, in that case, you might be putting in a, a little canopy structure or something like that, and that, that could go in, particularly in this instance where the, the members are off the orthogonal axes. Uh, so that was even more useful in those scenarios. Okay, uh, next up, we have got uh, beam eccentricities. Not a new thing, but we've made some improvements to it that make it hopefully that a little bit more easy to use. So what are beam eccentricities? Um, first of all, albeit they're, albeit they're a property that's applied to the beam, but what they actually uh, influence is the design of the column. So we just uh, uh, pause this for a little second here. Um, the eccentricity of the beam relative to the column is what's important because the it informs the uh, nominal uh, offset lever arms and uh, then the nominal moments that get produced in the column for design purposes. Uh, so as I say, the eccentricities were here before. Um, some people find it maybe a bit more challenging to try and understand the orientation of the eccentricity or the direction of the eccentricity. So there's a, a bit of an explanation here as to what the beam eccentricities are. That's new. Also, this diagram is new to show you which uh, direction the eccentricity is going relative to the start and end nodes of the member. So if you were to turn on your node numbers, you would get uh, a lower node number and a higher node number, and that would tell you which direction. Uh, usually you're talking about the minor axis direction. So you're, when you're looking at the beam, you're looking at its plan axis, which direction it's going to move in, which is we're saying beam plan here. So letting this play on, we can see here we've got, uh, uh, then you've got eccentricities which are parallel to the beam and then ones that are perpendicular to the beam. So you can see there as we click on the plus or the minus, the new thing also now is that the drawing is updated to show you um, physically where that beam is being moved to. So you can have full confidence in knowing, yes, that's the direction, that's the side of the column that I want this beam to be located and influence the design. And also then that eccentricity is uh, then taken through to any um, CAD drawing exports that you might be doing as well uh, to, to actually represent the physical location of the beam for your, for your CAD drawing outputs. So some uh, really useful clarifications and simplifications there uh, on that beam eccentricity. This one's uh, actually one of my favorites, really simple. Um, wasn't a great deal of development work involved in it, but I think it actually <laughs> makes things really useful. Um, I guess the inspiration of this, uh, well, what we're talking about here is the ability to set a member's beat angle relative to a plane and where that's difficult is potentially sometimes where you've got a, an, an off axis plane or uh, something that isn't entirely obvious or, or whether you've got a member traversing a, a plane. It might be um, a simple plane, but uh, where it's not traversing on orthogonal axes, then the beta angles can be a bit tricky to try and figure out, well, what is the precise angle I would need to set this member at to align it properly with the plane? So what we've got here, um, we've got some timber cross bracing members, which in this instance, certainly probably don't represent the angle that we would want these to be in. Uh, we've also got a purlin member here, which might be fine and the axis is in, but if you wanted to rotate it, it's sitting vertically at the moment. So let's just have a, a look at this, uh, what's going on here. So if we uh, select this purlin member. Um, we can do a control click on a connecting member and you can see that that member now is orientated perfectly perpendicular to the plane. If we do an alt click, 
then we get it going the other direction, which is going back to a control click. And you can see down here, it was just a simple um, 35 degrees, uh, sorry, minus 35 degrees, plus 55 degrees. You would have probably known the slope of this plane was 35 degrees. That would have been simple enough to do. But the story changes a little bit when you come to these members, because uh, they are not so simple to terms in terms of that. So a control click shows us that was 27 or minus 27.92 degrees, and an alt click, which is the axis we want this to be in, gives us the 62.08 degrees, uh, which you know would have been a bit more challenging to try and work out exactly what that was for those members to align exactly in those planes. So hopefully you find that very useful. Just as an aside, um, the, I guess the inspiration of this was the, we already have a, fe a, fe a feature like this for columns, whereby if you click on a column and you want to set the beta angle of a column relative to incoming connected beams, you can do the same trick. You can do a control or alt click on any of the incoming connected beams, and that sets the beta angle of the column relative to those you may have known that, you might not. Another wee free tip for you today. Um, right, next up, we have a new feature for, uh, and it's primarily a diagnostic feature of when things go wrong in your nonlinear analysis, but it potentially can be used even when things are going right to give you a bit of insight as to what's going on with your nonlinear analysis and how it's actually impacting on your structure. So as I said, it's great for divergent analysis. What we've got here is a little portal frame, uh, a 3D portal frame. And when we go to do look at our analysis, we can see that it is uh, has some P-delta analysis on, it has some plastic analysis on. Doing the analysis, we can see that we've straight away in load case one got a, a P-delta analysis issue. Uh, and the message there was telling us that we could go and look in the results nonlinear result settings, um, iteration snapshot settings to, to have a look at this here. I should say this is optional and it can be turned off and on by going to the analysis menu. There's global analysis options and there's a checkbox in there for turning off or on the capturing of the nonlinear iteration information as you're doing your nonlinear analysis. So it might not be something you need to turn on every time. Now, this, in this instance, uh, we've only got results for load case one because that's how far the analysis got. We might have had 10 convergent cases before load case 11 failed to converge, and we would get all the information for those as well. So what we've got is load case one, load ratio one. Uh, well, what that really is, we do support um, incremental loading for nonlinear analysis. So in this case, uh, there is no incremental load, all the load was applied all at one time. So it's load ratio, one as in 100% of the load it has been applied in one iteration. Oh, apologies. Um, I'll just go back to that. And uh, we'll play that again. So we have here all the iterations that took place in um, this. So we've had six iterations and we can see the convergence ratio increasing in each one. So we can change the magnification and plan view. We can get a little bit of a flavor of what's going on. Second iteration, we can see the apex node of that intermediate portal frame uh, taking a, a bit of a walk in the wrong direction. And we can see that that convergence factor is increasing instead of reducing. And the program's detected. This is diverging. It's not going to converge. And uh, you know we're not going to get a solution here. You were also given the out-of-balance um, node there. Uh, so that, that can be really useful. So really the issue there is that uh, obviously in reality, we've got purlins in this portal frame, which we haven't modeled. And generally you don't model your purlins because they just get taken into account at design time. But for nonlinear uh, space frame analysis, uh, you know, they, things like that can start to make a difference. So obviously the answer would be, we would commonly advise people put it in an apex time member and potentially also further time members along the lines of your uh, bracing connection points. So that would solve that type of problem. Um, again, another little tip for you. So coming on, now we're moving on to connections. But as I say, look at the full 30 list of new things in MasterFrame. There's lots of really additional nice new things there. And uh, you'll find probably other things that are more important to you than the five that we have just focused on. Connections, 23 new features, and this is our top five. Um, 
printing of load cases and connections has uh, been a, a, somewhat of a little bit of a, a head scratching moment for some people, to the particularly to the uninitiated. Uh, we're talking about load or connections that support multiple load cases, and uh, those connections um, obviously produce a full set of design results for each of the load cases that they um, are designing to. And uh, you know you might have uh, scores and scores of loading cases, and it wouldn't be a case that you'd want to produce a design report that reports on all of them. So the printing of a load case is optional. You 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 decide whether you want the load case to be printed or not printed. And um, we can see here we've introduced a, 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 a little feature here. Then when the loading case is not set to printing, you get a little non-printable note to say the load case isn't printing. If that's not a, a, a mix of definition and terms there. So uh, we just let this play a little bit um, where that setting for that printing load case is currently. This isn't new. We've got the option to print the current load case, uh, which is load case one, either on or off. And then we go to a different case and you can choose to print that load case on or off. A little bit of a pain. And the other issue is, how do I know which loaded case to print, which are the important ones? And this is where these, this new select print cases feature comes in, whereby for this connection, so we're looking at results for one connection and for all the loading cases associated with that connection. You can see your other connections in the drop list as well. So not just one maximum unity ratio, but all the unity ratios for all the different attributes of the design are all gathered together for all the different loading cases in one place. And really, the, what you're doing here, uh, for every row that you highlight or every item in the, in the, uh, that you select in this list, that's you telling it, I want this loading case to print. So uh, you can simply click on whichever rows you want or use the automatically select tool. So I've just selected there to select the top four loading cases to print. Or I can say I want to uh, select all of the loading cases above a 0.9 unity ratio. Uh, so that's um, those loading cases are then set to print. So you can come on to another joint and do the same thing. Uh, you know, we can arrange the table in whatever primary um, thing that's important to us and uh, do the same selection there. There's also an auto select for all connections that uh, were just on the screen we just left. Um, and just to pause here for a second, obviously what we were doing previously was looking at a connection by connection to select the loading cases. This new multi-select connection print case setting allows you to uh, select multiple cases, sorry, multiple connections, and then uh, select which common cases that you want to activate for print. So it might primarily be that across the board for all your Eves connections that you want um, the uh, a particular set of loading cases to print. And you could do that, select all your Eves connections, and then on the right-hand side there, select which loading cases do you want to print for all of those, and apply those to the multiple connections that you've selected in, in one file sweep. Uh, so when we, when we go back to um, the per connection result, we can see then now that uh, all of those loading cases have been selected through the multi-select option. So you might be looking at this and go, well, that's really nice, but that's a nice summary there. Can I get that on page uh, or export to Word? And you can. There's a, It's a slightly separate distinct tool there uh, from that uh, add loading case drop down there, whereby uh, this is our print summary of the same information. So you now can do a print summary of uh, that information, uh, export to Word or print it to printer. It's also useful for navigating cases and moving between cases with the power of looking at your unity ratios as well as you go. OK, let's pick up the pace here a little bit. Um, connections, uh, we're looking here at our base plate connections. And <clears throat> uh, quite, a, quite a meaty document there we've uh, had a look at is the, uh, the EN, the Eurocode, 19, uh, Eurocode 2, which is EN 1992 part 4 for the design of anchor bolts. And um, obviously the elements of this document, which are important to us in terms of base plates, are the, uh, the pull-out cones and how we had potentially could improve what we were doing previously. Previously, you had options for your traditional conical or recto-conical 
pull out cones and uh, you or, or you also had the option to do uh, a punching method, punching shear method where you had top reinforcement. Uh, that made sense to do that uh, as per one of the older SCI green books. But the, the Eurocode, uh, Eurocode 2 part 4 uh, certainly gives a much richer basis for doing pull out cones because they do then handle very nicely the edge conditions. Uh, whereas previously, Master Series would have warned you whenever um, your pullout cone was close to an edge condition, but uh, you know there was no countenance of, of of that edge condition and its impact on the cone. You just got a warning that your cone uh, may be intersecting with an edge condition. Whereas now the the this this document uh, can deal with those edge conditions is one of its other benefits. So we have here a connection that has a bit of moment and uh, some axial force as well. So we can see tension on one side, compression on the other. So the, the left-hand bolts that we're looking at here are indeed in tension and will be experiencing um, a pullout. And the design will now be done to this part of the code. And we can see there uh, the section and part of the code that it's dealing with. And in this case, all four edges are beyond 1.5 HEF, so that's fine. So we're looking at single cone for one bolt, uh, or sorry, individual cone for one bolt and single cone for the two bolts. And then fastener pullout is a new thing as well. Uh, that is part of that document. So introducing a, a left edge condition, which is obviously the edge relative to the, uh, the vertical edge relative to the bolts that are in tension. And we can see now that one of the edges has been reduced and you get your A0CN and your ACN are in, um, different values now and, and all the calculations are updated for that. So pullout cones are certainly more advantageous and there's benefit to be had with that. Just moving on here, we're now looking at the shear aspects of this document. And uh, one of the things you, you got to take account of is uh, shear with lever arm. So where your um, bolts are, uh, your, your grout grade don't, doesn't meet certain criteria or grout depths doesn't meet certain criteria. You do have a need for the shear that takes place at this interface, bending about a, a lever arm of where the bolt crushes against the concrete. So there's a little bit of an extra bending uh, uh, thing to, to take place there. Um, not quite as critical as you might think uh, because of the way in which um, the uh, bearing capacity in the concrete was reduced in, in previous uh, iterations of the codes. Um, now, what is new is uh, this concrete pry out shear failure, which is quite similar to the pull out cone, but with a, a K8 factor involved, uh, which uh, is a pull out mechanism through the, through the application of shear. Um, we've also then got concrete edge shear, which is new uh, and not, uh, uh, not uh, part of what was designed previously. So where you're con you're, you've got an edge condition and uh, you know the, the concrete, the, the, the bolts can tear out through the edge of the concrete, uh, that's also being designed. Side steel can play a part in helping to uh, improve that edge concrete tear out. Uh, so if you've got some edge steel then, uh, or side steel, then certainly do specify that. Next up, we've got a really nice new feature for um, flexible end plates that, uh, where you've got flexible end plates coming on to both sides of, could be a beam web, could be a column web. And uh, in these scenarios, what you can see here clearly is that you've got an issue straight away because the software previously only supported regular vertical center to centers. So we got a bit of a bolt clashing problem on the side where the bottom flange of the smaller beam. But now we can make those spacings irregular. So I'm typing in here 1 at 80 and followed by 120, followed by another 1 at uh, 70. Could have just said 80, 120, 70, um, but just to demonstrate, if you have multiple spacings, you don't have to type them all out. Um, and that gives you uh, a nice uh, variable spacing of the bolts. Um, it doesn't have to be, it solves this particular problem, but you can use this variable spacing for any reason. I don't can't see why, what other reason you might want to use it uh, other than this, this type of scenario, but it's uh, there for you to use and it's nice and easy to use as well. 
Okay, another heavily sought uh, after and heavily requested new feature was the ability to take a simple connection and convert it to a different type of connector. All of our simple connections, um, two main forms, beam to beam, beam to column, and three main connectors, flexible end plate, fin plate, and web cleat. We've got a flexible end plate here, and using the little drop down menu there, we are able now to convert it automatically to a fin plate. And the same options also repeat in the edit menu, just to show you an alternative way to find those. We changed that fin plate now to a web cleat. So if you spent a lot of time putting in a connection and um, you wonder, well, how's this gonna perform if I change it from a fin plate to a flexible end plate, each of the types of connectors will always convert to the other two. Um, so that's uh, hopefully gonna save you a bit of time there in terms of having to, to re-enter those types of information uh, when you want to experiment with different types. Should say that this copies the connection rather than changes it which is better because you still have your original to go back to because if you convert to one and can convert back again, you might not arrive at exactly the same place. So you always have your original to uh, fall back on. Next up, we've got uh, our bracing connections. Uh, what we're looking at here is a hollow section brace connection. Um, the uh, tab plate on the end of the hollow section. In this instance, it happens to be an embedded plate, but it could be an L plate or a T plate. Um, that's not particularly relevant. Uh, what is relevant is the new option to, uh, uh, where, in this case, where the, the, the tab plate overlaps the gusset plate. So there's a little bit of eccentricity there between the tab plate and the gusset plate, which is taken into account in the gusset plate buckling design. But we've got a new option now for um, double cover plates. And when you say yes, basically the tab plate then gets offset to, uh, so your tab plate and gusset plate need to be the same thickness, I guess is obvious, but you've got now two cover plates, one either side of the gusset plate, which obviously puts your bolts in double shear and uh, can alleviate uh, that in that way. So, you know, we probably need less bolts. Um, so, uh, but then that obviously will, it, it just depends on whether the, you know, there's maybe particular scenarios that this might work better for you. Um, it's covered, it's one of the scenarios that's mentioned in the, uh, the Green Book, the SCI P358. Uh, it, it minimizes the eccentricity or rather uh, eliminates the eccentricity of between the plates. So that's one advantage, but there's other also disadvantages in terms of of buckling and things like that as well. So uh, just to keep your eye on, on that. Okay, moving on. Composite beam design, 17 new features. This is our top five. Um, we've got a slightly similar to connections, but different in a way, both exporting to Word and uh, exporting to printer. Um, we have had for a number of years the ability to manage the, um, you know, which briefs you want to print, and they were you were getting this to some extent previously with maximum unity ratios. What's different now is that we're using uh, uh, member referencing, but we're also listing out the full set of unity ratios uh, in the uh, in this table, whereas previously you were just getting the maximum ones. So that's uh, uh, a nice um, facility there. So yes, it helps you in terms of looking at all your members and sorting them by the different unity ratios, potentially looking at which ones are more critical, but you've also got the option to print that list summary, uh, both to Word and to printer. Uh, we're doing it here to Word, just producing a PDF. And uh, I believe that's, then just needs to be dragged into view. So this is the type of output you can get, which is a really nice summary of all your members and all the different unity ratios uh, for those, the maximum unity ratios for those, for the, all those composite beams. Um, so yeah, really nice. Design groups in composite beams, along with improved deflection checking, we're gonna cover both of those in this one little video snippet. We've got here, obviously, composite floor. Um, what we're going to look at then is our composite design groups. Composite design groups themselves aren't new, but they have been extended and made more useful. 
Previously, I think you just had maximum depths and a limited, uh, you know, quite a uh, quite a, a simple way of controlling deflection. Whereas now you've got much more sophisticated ways of controlling deflection, and you've also got options to make the studs and the mesh the same optionally. How we deal with deflection limit sets is is much more intuitive. You get a drop list now to say whether you want to use a deflection limit set as opposed to putting in your own values. So making our way across to the composite design now, we'll see those coming into play. <clears throat> Another slight change there is um, as you would click on a, a group, that group had a setting to make all the sections the same size. So all the members are highlighted in 3D, but the other members of the group are highlighted in, a, in an off-red color to indicate to you always that they are part of the same section size. What we're looking at here is that as we navigate between the members, you can see the um, the settings of keeping the spacing of the studs or the same and the mesh uh, reinforcement the same. As we change that, going from one member to another in this um, secondary beam group now, uh, they now follow suit across that. Going across to our deflections again, some of these settings were controlled by the group and we can see that coming in there, but immediately you also can see that this whole interface has improved significantly uh, in terms of how deflections are input. Um, you may, uh, as an initiated master beam composite beam design user in the past have been aware that you can access some of these settings, but you had to go through an option to say that you want to use modified program defaults. That's no longer the case. It operates in a much similar fashion to all the other software in that if you want to make these settings different, then they're there for you. You don't have to then turn anything on to access them or anything like that. So again, lovely changes here. If you want to use a deflection limit set as opposed to inputting these values, you've got that there in a nice handy to use drop list with an edit button on the deflection limit set. Also the span over and absolute are separated out. So you, again, you can clearly see where you might need to, where you need to put in two values, whereas I think previously you had to put in two values, uh, comma separated or colon separated. So here we have a deflection limit set, and deflection limit sets um, aren't new, but what is new is actually you can actually save those to a file or retrieve them from a file or save them as the default. And indeed the, the deflection limits the default deflection limits that we are now getting in the composite beam design are much more sensible uh, in, in relation to uh, what you uh, might want uh, in accordance with uh, latest SCI guides as well. So you're less likely to have to need to go here and make changes and put things in. Um, just a slight side note on deflections. Uh, there is ponding checks uh, that appear and uh, if deflection on the dead load only cases above a certain value will give you start to give you a little bit of a warning to say you know you might want to consider extra dead load because of ponding um, but that's uh, I'm squeezing another feature in there <laughs> that's uh, outside of what we're talking about in these two items okay next up um, lateral torsional buckling of secondary beams at the construction phase previously and uh, you know, the, the, the general assumption was that where you've got metal deck profiles spanning perpendicular onto the beam, the ribs themselves were stiff enough to create or prevent against lateral torsional buckling of the top compre compression flange. And indeed that is the case for the vast, vast majority of situations. However, there were sections in the Eurocode that dealt with the edge conditions potentially whereby the deck may not have been stiff enough. And uh, you need to check that. So we are now doing that. Um, it is summarized in that reference there, SEIP 360 in that section, but it is straight out of the Eurocode. So we do calculate now the buckling force that's produced by the member against the deck stiffness. And uh, if in this case, the, the buckling force is less than the deck stiffness, so we're good. Uh, but we're just gonna create a false situation here to make the deck less stiff by forcing down its thickness, the most convenient way to do to illustrate that. And now we are getting a check uh, a lateral torsional buckling check at construction stage, but taking into account some of the contribution of the deck and the stiffness that, that produces, we're still good. We're still okay. We're still not, uh, don't have a lateral torsional buckling problem. One thing to keep your eye on here is the BR number. 
the VR there is the length of continuous deck connected to the beam. In this case, it's 2475, which happens to be the length of the one of the adjacent connected beams. And you might say, well, why is it not longer? Why is it not the full bay length there? Well, Master Series doesn't know where the deck starts and stops, so you need to help us a little bit. We do have this continuous profile here and checking the continuous profile and again, reducing the thickness just so we can see that calculation again shows us that that has now been increased to the 2475 plus 1900 uh, because it's, we assume it's continuous across that. But if our deck was continuous across the entire bay of that seven and a half ish meters, then you can input that. There's an input for the BR value. So if you do end up coming across issues where you are running into problems with lateral torsional buckling, of your uh, beams, your secondary beams at the construction stage of, of metal deck, where metal deck profile is involved, then do check out what BR value has been used and uh, enter a more appropriate one where you need to. Just another side, no screen capture or slide in this here, but improved um, dimensional checking for studs and pairs and flanges. It's default to 5D plus 40 millimeter for 20 for each of the edge to edge of the edge of the stud to the edge of the flange. Uh, and that was being checked previously, but we now there are alternative arrangements um, whereby you can put them a little closer in a staggered pattern. And we advise you when that's suitable to do so, because you do have to have an appropriate width of trough to facilitate that. So where you can get away with that, we'll tell you about that. And hopefully that will be useful. OK, next up, master key steel design. Six new features, only six. Uh, this is our top three. So it has had a little bit of less of a focus. Very similar to the composite beam design, you get your print summary um, with full set of unity ratios, um, which is somewhat dynamic in a way because uh, much more difficult job trying to fit um, potentially all sorts of different types of unity ratios from all different types of steel designs into, uh, if you like, a one size fits all. But it, it ha we have achieved that. Uh, some of the terms are maybe made more generic um, in terms of the unity ratios, so they're grouped into um, general, local, buckling, shear, that type of thing, uh, which are common attributes of design among different types of um, design checks that are done. It's a, a very similar sort of replacement to the print management that uh, you had previously. So it includes all the same features that you had previously in, in terms of uh, the filtering and the selection. Uh, but you'll find this more efficient. And uh, as well as that, when you export that summary, just like the composite, you're getting a much better and cleaner and more informative um, print summary than what you were getting previously. And there's a little example of it, export to Microsoft Word. Next up, we've got shear checks. Now, before our audience descends into panic and say, what, Master Series not doing shear checks before? Let us assure you we were. We always have been. And if you had a shear problem in your beam, you would have known about it. Um, <clears throat> the common situation that came up was our shear check was done as part of our local capacity check. Uh, and there you can see shear values being checked. Um, however, the shear value is very low when actually the shear at the end of the beam is about 35 kilonewtons. And this caused quite often problems, especially coming from checking engineers, maybe asking why is the shear not checked? Well, um, it was checked, I guess, internally in the software, the, 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 the member, this is a member that has a, a bending moment diagram with a UDL load on it. The design is checked at hundreds of increments along the length of the member. And the critical section is selected uh, for reporting purposes for the local capacity. Um, obviously, shear is related to the local capacity because you can have high shear, which then influences your, uh, your moment capacity, uh, which is why <clears throat> we still have it here as an item to say, yeah, low shear, and that then the bending is not affected. But the, 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 for the output purposes, the shear capacity has now been uh, separated and uh, the, the, the shear check at the maximum point is given in the report. So it is a reporting issue. It will help people uh, to to demonstrate that you don't have a shear problem in your beam. But as I say, just to categorically say, if you had a shear problem in your beam, you would have definitely known about it and we would have reported it if, if it was more critical than the bending moment um, 
or the local capacity checks then you would have seen that being reported at the end of the member but it's there next quite a simple little change but hopefully um, will make quite a bit of difference deflection checking uh, when you had an axial with moment check previously always looked at the in span deflection um, which really is the differential deflection between the or departure of the, the member from a straight line between the start and end members so quite suitable of course that's what you want when you're looking at beams you want to know what the in span local deflection is um, obviously when you're looking at a cantilever you want to know the cantilever deflection and that's something you could have set previously as well and the fact the program would automatically detect that in a lot of situations to say yeah this is a cantilever we're going to give you a cantilever check and a cantilever deflection uh, and a, quite a similar note now we're doing that for columns where the la lateral sway is more critical than the inspan then we're going to present that lateral sway check um, so you get an inspan uh, deflection check uh, for the column which is the differential lateral deflection between the top and bottom nodes obviously those are our main um, core programs we're going to now do a roundup of uh, 10 of the best of the rest from the remaining 50 features now, we obviously when i say remaining 50 features that's the remaining 50 of the programs we haven't yet covered uh, so there's lots still in master frame lots still in composite connection steel design um, that aren't part of that 50. Um, so first up is our steel sections open library databases a lot of work has gone into those actually this time around and in fact databases in general but we now have um, our database is updated uh, to the latest uh, full range of sections that are included in the blue book. Um, just showing you here that uh, there, there's an easy navigation between the different variants of the set of the databases. The generic one was what you had previously, which was a mix of UK and European sections. But we have now separated the UK and European sections into their own databases. But your existing files will continue to use the databases that they currently are using so that won't affect anything now when we go to the uk database here uh, a few things we'll notice is that we have a new filtering option called check availability and the blue book that's a, a, a characteristic or a feature of uh, hollow sections in particular so all the sections that are marked as check availability uh, as part of the blue book uh, we now have that followed through to the software uh, which also means then in the software in the database settings you can say hide all the sections that have a check availability against them which is another type of filtering tool to uh, there's so many hollow sections uh, available or poten well, not potentially available but so many hollow sections in the blue books uh, that we have to make available as part of the software but uh, anecdotally we've heard lots of stories of you know um, the use of hollow sections being used that are uh, very difficult to get and this check availability will definitely assist you in terms of uh, trying to not potentially use those sections by filtering them out uh, in your database settings next up we've got report generators uh, three new features actually for report generators you've got uh, three new uh, really nice wizards which uh, do the job of generating, if you like, multiple report items in 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 one uh, in one report layout item. Uh, you've got they're all concerned with uh, graph uh, the presentation of analysis results, and uh, you've got one for graphical analysis results, uh, member diagram analysis results, and internal force table analysis results. What we're looking at here now is the one for internal force table uh, which is a table by table uh, member by member table uh, giving you the detailed forces inside a member and various increments and this wizard here allows us to select multiple members multiple load cases and then also set the intervals and then that produces all the um, output so for instance we've got load case one and two selected here so it's going to produce six tables uh, and from what we can see here anyway uh, of that whereas previously I think you had to almost set those up as 
individual report items. Similar thing for uh, member diagrams. Uh, slightly different for graphical analysis output. Um, you get the option to create items to say, well, I want to report on bending moments, say major axis only. Uh, and you get to add multiple different types of graphical analysis output, which you can control the settings of. And then you get to say which loading cases you want those produced for. And again, it will produce the multiples of the graphical output for all the different types of graphical output along with the loading cases. Uh, so it's much more powerful than some of the reporting options that were there previously for those. Um, kind of stuck away at the end here, but this is a really nice new feature and <clears throat> one of the more significant ones. Uh, timber design groups. <clears throat> for, for those of you who maybe don't know what a design group is, um, we've had design groups obviously, we've come across them already for composite, we've had them around for steel and for concrete uh, more recently, but we now have them for timber as well. A design group effectively is the ability to say that a set of members all share a common set of design parameters primarily. And optionally here, as you see, can see as well, you can say you want their section property in this instance all to be the same. Um, without this, uh, your, your design parameters and your section sizes are operated independently. So if you were to change the, say the deflection limit or the bearing of one member, uh, then you know, you'd know you also have to go and change it for another member as well, if they were already set up with their design check. Whereas the design groups make all that data common under your control and uh, give you a lot of power. And they've been proven to be very powerful in the past and we've now extended that to the timber design. So uh, coming into the timber design here, we can see um, the member and uh, You've also got options in there to control the off on switch of keeping the section properties the same. And uh, if you were to change any of the section properties here in this tab, that would follow suit to all the other members because this group had set up with section properties optionally to be all the same. Okay, moving on. Um, gosh, how time flies. <laughs> We've got master key wind analysis uh, <clears throat> and a, a nice handy little feature here to, uh, for the wind directions and settings to make, uh, to use the maximum wind pressure in all directions. Obviously we know in our modern codes for wind design, uh, your wind pressure, wind site pressure will vary in all the different directions because of topography and um, fetches, and even also because of the UK standard SD factors uh, will vary around the site. So you get very different wind coming in different directions, which is all very well and good if you know the orientation of your building. <clears throat> but perhaps in a preliminary design phase, you don't. And it may be advantageous to say, well, let's just be conservative and use the maximum. Or you just want to be conservative, regardless of whether you know the orientation of your building or not. The choice is yours. Wow, uh, this one actually is a really major um, uh, development uh, issue for us in terms of the amount of time spent. We uh, uh, undertook a significant project to upgrade all of our database technology across the master series system to use uh, SQLite. And uh, whilst for you as the engineer, you might think, well, that's under the bonnet, it doesn't really affect me, but it does actually, it has actually brought across, apart from um, making the master series software more future-proof and more agile and easier for us to manage and develop. Uh, it also has introduced some additional nice new features such as shareable databases. Previously with the database technology we were using, the steel sections open library database had to be local to your machine and you only could use a database that was resident on your machine. Whereas with shareable databases, you can actually say your steel section database is on a network share and uh, Lots of people can connect to that database in a read-only fashion and use the data from it. Um, only one person can edit it at a time, but lots of people can use it, which is obviously what's 99% of the time that the database is being used for. We're retrieving information from the database. So if you do have a company-wide common set of uh, open library database, then you can 
have that in a single shareable location as opposed to having one that has to be managed and distributed around everybody. Same thing goes for connection templates uh, database um, that also can be shared and placed in a, in a different location in a network share. This SQLite also has advantages for IT admins and that there's it's local deployment. Now, uh, you forgive me for uh, going a bit off engineering, but uh, previous database uh, technologies required prerequisite installations of database tech, uh, providers uh, with uh, other third party installations needed. Where uh, for IT admins who do a local, or, um, if you like, a, a, a broadcast type deployment uh, across all of their workstations on their environment. Uh, this will make life a lot easier for you because it is just local deployment. It's just the, the local files copied. There's no prerequisites for these databases. Uh, rest assured as well, any existing user created databases, uh, the content in them is automatically migrated across to this new database technology. Okay, with the few minutes we have left, uh, we can say that the PowerPad users get point loads as part of masonry design. Great news. Uh, so the local bearing stress calculation that's done at, uh, beneath, directly beneath the, uh, the point load um, will all be checked in the PowerPad version. Also on masonry, <clears throat> you now have an option to uh, specify uh, the normalized or to turn off the specifying of the normalized mean strength. Normalized mean strength was the default. Previously, you, when you gave us a compression strength, you were giving us the normalized mean strength as opposed to the standard compression strength. Uh, what that means is effectively, this is a Eurocode thing, by the way, um, the, uh, that mean, the normalized means it was, it was a specific strength for the uh, size of your block that you're using. And usually those would come straight out of the manufacturers and you would use those, but potentially where that wasn't available and you just had the basic compression strength, the air dried compression strength of the material and you wanted the software to work out the normalized mean compression strength which is what gets used for design we are now calculating the shape factor uh, um, augmentation of that and uh, or sometimes reduction and, and calculating that from the value that's being entered wow well those of you who get involved in response factor analysis and design would really like to see this here much more control over the contour output in response factors uh, just casting your eye down the bottom right here you can uh, optionally turn off the legend draw values um, the, the values the characteristic points is a new thing you can actually turn off and on as is controlling the number of contours but probably most importantly and usefully you've got a response factor limit whereby you can control the color ranges above and below what is your acceptable limit of response. And you can quite clearly see there the distinction between the green areas and the orange red areas that uh, fall outside uh, what, you, what you want. Uh, Master Series Tech Link Designer, um, we're looking at a few openings here. We did do openings to uh, a more limited extent previously in that we were doing discrete web openings. Whereas now we're actually doing, and those were unidirectional, whereas now we're doing both cellular beams and discrete web openings, both bidirectionally linked, uh, with the cellular beams being a proper implementation of um, the situation where what happens in reality of a parent section being uh, ribbon cut and uh, repositioned and rewelded, we do form the two separate parts of them and then put them together as is uh, the recommendation. Uh, finally, we just have some better control over our CAD drawing output of uh, the composite beam shear stud and mesh reinforcement that you get in composite beams. Previously, this was how it was presented. You got all the information. You had no control over what was in and what was out. Whereas now there are settings to say, well, what information you want to include. So you've got, for example, 25 19 by 95 studs at 300 centers, and then this is your mesh reinforcement. You've now then got the ability to say, well, I just want <clears throat> the number and the spacing of the studs, and then you can produce a separate drawing with just the, um, the mesh reinforcement on it. Makes things a little bit cleaner where you've got a crowded space uh, for all of that. So uh, that was a quick whistle stop tour. Lots of information fired at you. Um, and uh, I think we were able to cover a lot more just by focusing on the, on the PowerPoint. 
just to finish up, uh, we're really excited about this new uh, program, this new application we have coming very soon, our Master Series LCA web-based application. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with LCA, it's life cycle analysis. Um, uh, and uh, we're looking at this for building purposes, building structure purposes. A life cycle analysis is an assessment of the, um, well, one of the, th one of the assessed things it can assess is the embodied carbon in um, anything that would impact on the environment. Um, but as I say, we're focusing on buildings, but it does look at the full uh, gathering up resources of materials, um, manufacturing, construction, transportation, use of the building and disposal of the use of the building. So the full life cycle analysis of how your building impacts on the environment. And, and as I say, effectively, we're mainly talking about embodied carbon here. So uh, we're dealing with a, um, a web-based application that will BIM integrate with master frame, master series, master series building design suite to receive information and enable you to produce reports for uh, for those items and as well as that is to you know to 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 really then um, specify lots of in extra information above and beyond what master series knows about the building uh, so you get a full picture but certainly the the structural aspects of a building do form the a significant portion of the embodied carbon of the building but you can put in extra details like claddings and things like that that uh, will will add to that as an extra process as part of this uh, environment uh, the, it's going to come shipped with uh, hundreds of EPDs, which is environmental product declarations, which are individual data sets of components of, uh, it could be basic materials or it could be manufactured specific products that have their uh, EPDs. Those will be built into the software. And um, one of the really useful things and the, the, the impetus of, behind using something like this is so that you can actually produce potentially a couple of different alternatives to your design brief and then compare the embodied carbon of those so you can make better decisions and more informed decisions about what way you want to design and construct your building and use your building to to minimize its impact on the environment um, so yeah we're really excited about that uh, you can uh, we'll certainly be doing a dedicated webinar on this uh, when we launch this product uh, but a lot of work has gone on to this year and uh, it's a really exciting step for us in, in this direction. Uh, and uh, we're delighted to play our part in terms of our contribution to making a reduction to our carbon footprint, which is obviously a huge part of what we do as engineers. Just remains for me to say thank you very much for all of you for attending today's webinar. I hope you enjoyed it. and. Um, we're able to digest the uh, plethora of information just fired at you. If you have any questions at all, uh, feel free to contact us. If you'd like to talk to us about a software purchase, it's sales at masterseries.com. Uh, for anything else, mostly help at masterseries.com for any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar.